Hey Wafters, Mr. Lasseter here, and in this video we're going to wrap up our uh, final information on Britain's empire, and we're focusing on its eastern empire as opposed to uh, what we saw in India. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. Just as a reminder, uh, the Napoleonic Wars and the British defeat of the combined French and Dutch forces in these wars allowed Britain to expand its control in South Africa, Southeast Asia, and the Southern Caribbean. Uh, the most valuable of these uh, new colonies was the Cape Colony in Southern Africa. Uh, and it was valuable to Britain because of its strategic importance as a supply station on the route to India. Now, to really understand this region, you have to be reminded of the history of this region. So, um, in South Africa, uh, about in the mid-1600s, the Dutch colonized. Uh, and for a century and a half, these Afrikaner Boers, uh, as they called themselves, displaced and conquered native Africans. When the British assumed control over South Africa during the Napoleonic Wars, the Boers themselves were displaced. In the 1830s, they make their great trek north and east, and in the 1850s founded uh, the Orange Free State and the South African Republic, known as Transvaal, both of which bordered British South Africa. In the meantime, though, they and the, and the recently arriving British came into contact with that new native power, the Zulu tribe, uh, that we talked about the other day. The Zulu had been defeating neighbor after neighbor, causing a significant wave of tribal migration in the region, and uh, they also took on the British and the Boers in several wars. Uh, but it took several attempts for the Europeans to ultimately overcome the Zulu. Uh, the last major conflict was in 1879, and it was provoked by uh, British officials who hoped to move into Zulu lands because of the, the discovery of diamond fields. Um, gold deposits were also found, and the emergence of this region with such great wealth potential caused some destabilization. The British had annexed the fields in 1871. They had cruelly uh, exploited African labor. And by 1879, uh, of course, these heightened tensions broke out into war, what was known as the Zulu War of 1879. And here's an image, uh, a painting from it. Um, so we see this conflict in, in southern Africa, but the British ultimately are able to overcome this uh, and, and establish a Cape Colony, uh, and eventually South Africa. The, the Zulu were not the only group the British came into contact with. Uh, for example, also subjected to foreign rule were South Africa's Hosa people, um, who tried to uh, resist... Um, British rule, and one form of resistance was spurred on by belief systems. Um, there was a, a young woman who had a vision that spirits came to her and basically said that if the Hosa people destroyed their crops and all their cattle and their livestock, that the spirits would drive the British out of, of uh, southern Africa. And this Hosa cattle killing movement is what we call a millennialist movement. Um, the millennialist movements are usually um, associated with some kind of apocalyptic or major event that changes uh, the way society would happen. Uh, and in this case, they were relying on some religious beliefs, um, some um, forms of resistance to drive out the British. Um, there's another one that you can look up that, that kind of fits in this, uh, in this course called the uh, Ghost Dance. But the host cattle killing movement is the one I've, I've chosen to talk about. Um, the, the downside of this was that the Hosa expecting this great ex uh, event when it does not happen um, are now left without valuable crops and, and livestock. And this ultimately... Um, leads to kind of self-destruction. Um, they blamed the failure of this event on some people who did not believe in the prophecy and had not killed their livestock and destroyed their crops. Uh, and of course, those people's uh, farms were raided in the ensuing famine. Um, 
of course, the British government did nothing to, to kind of reach out and help these people. And so we see um, the host of people uh, population-wise uh, decrease quite substantially um, from about 105,000 people to fewer to 27,000 uh, due to the resulting famine um, in uh, or following this. Uh, and this happened from about 1856 to 1857. Um, so the British are able, they do stay in this land. Um, in fact, this actually allows them to more easily take over the land controlled by the Hosa. Um, anyways, uh, the British also established a series of outposts in Southeast Asia, so it's not just Southern Africa. Um, they established outposts in uh, uh, Singapore, where Thomas Raffles established a free port in Singapore in 1824. Um, Assam is annexed to India around 1826, and Burma... Uh, is annexed in 1852, and these become important uh, trade, strategic trade outposts um, in this region, mainly because Southeast Asia uh, is an important stopping place between China and India. Similarly, South Africa was an important stopover from England to India. Historians usually depict Britain in this time period as a reluctant empire builder, uh, they were more interested in trade than acquiring territory, although sometimes um, to ensure that free trade existed, they, they were taking over territory. And so we have this idea, you know, is, is Britain greedy for control of resources and territory? Are they trade-based. Um, Britain had a, a, version, a, a vision of free trade uh, in a global shipping network. This was opposed to our previous mercantilist trade policies that we had seen. Um, and most of the new colonies were just intended to, uh, to serve as ports in this global shipping network. Although, um, certainly there were major drawbacks um, to establishing this. But whether colonized or not, African, Asian, and Pacific lands were being drawn into commercial networks created by British expansion and industrialization. These areas would become exporters of raw materials and agricultural goods and importers of affordable manufactured products. A second major uh, impetus of global commercial expansion was a t the technological revolution, uh, especially in ocean-going ships in the 19th century. The use of iron uh, was was uh, or excuse me iron was used to fasten timbers together in ships uh, to make stronger hulls they used huge canvas sails uh, which allowed shipbuilders to make larger faster vessels that would lower the cost of shipping and stimulate mari maritime trade and there also we see uh, in the later uh, in the 19th century we see larger ships being built remember in the 18th century most ships were relatively small uh, they were usually less than about 300 tons. But after 1850, American-built clipper ships and similar ships built in Europe would were commonplace, and they could hold up to two, or they were basically 200, or ah, excuse me, 2,000 tons, not 200,000 tons. That would be immense. They were just 2,000 tons. Uh, and this is an example of an American clipper ship. Of course, steam-powered ships will not be far behind. Let's not forget the far reaches of Earth, Australia and New Zealand. Uh, the development of these new ships and this new shipping technology allowed uh, Europeans and the British to move further and further out. Uh, the development of new ships and shipping contributed to the colonization of Australia and New Zealand. Of course, this colonization would lead to the displacement of the indigenous populations there, the Aborigines of Australia and the Maori of New Zealand. Unfamiliar diseases, of course, were brought by these new overseas contacts, and that substantially will reduce the populations of these Aborigines and Maori. They were largely hunter-gatherer societies um, and, and will be in conflict with, with uh, the settlers for some time. Australia is initially established as a penal colony for British convicts, and after the discovery of gold in 1851, 
we actually see that start to change. A flood of free European settlers come to the region, and even some Chinese settlers come to the regions of Australia. And you can see there in the map, uh, we're talking about the southeastern regions of Australia. British settlers were much slower in coming to New Zealand, uh, and that really did not take place until the defeat of the Maori tribes there. Uh, faster ships allowed this. A short gold rush brought more British immigration. Uh, but the defeat of the Maori was, was really what opens up this land to settlement. In both of these regions, the British crown gradually turned over governing power to the British settlers. Um, but even so, the Aborigine and Maori people are gonna, will continue to experience discrimination in these regions. Uh, and that was discrimination that, that was long-lasting. I remember in the, in the Sydney Summer Olympic Games, um, one of the first Aborigine um, athletes for, for Australia was, was running in those Olympics, and I believe medaled. Um, but there were lots of stories done about discrimination that was still going on in that region toward the Aborigine people. However, um, Australia, there, there are some kind of positives that come out of this uh, in, in this this region of the world, Australia, New Zealand being far away, and Australia developing as a penal colony, it's going to be kind of really, really different. Uh, it's the nicest way to say it. Uh, Australia developed powerful trade unions in in their region. New Zealand would promote the availability of land for the common person, and both of these places would grant women the right to vote in 1894. So, good job, Australia and New Zealand. During this time, we also see, uh, during this era of the British Empire, we also see new labor migration. And it's really important to, to think about this new labor migration uh, after understanding that the slave trade was on the way out. So between 1834 and 1870, we see large numbers of Indians, Chinese, and Africans go overseas as laborers. British India was going to be the greatest source of these migrant laborers. Uh, and British colonies, particularly sugar plantations, were the principal destinations of these migrants. With the end of slavery had come a demand for cheap labor in the British colonies and Cuba in Hawaii, and this was filled by Indians, free Africans, Chinese, and Japanese workers. And they were often uh, times brought over under contracts of indenture, which bound them to work for a specified number of years in return for free passage to the overseas destination. It would give them a small salary, free housing, etc. But it was still indentured servitude. We oftentimes, we refer to this uh, as coolie labor in, um, in, our, in our course. Um, this use of kind of this new indentured group. Um, although the term coolie can be used in a derogatory form now, especially in Africa, uh, in South Africa, in uh, referring to migrant Indian workers who, who came to South Africa. Uh, but nevertheless, these new indentured migrants were similar to the European emigrants of the time uh, in that they had left their homelands voluntarily in order to make money that they could send back home or to finance a new life in this new country. However, people recruited as indentured laborers were usually poorer than the European emigrants. They usually took lower paying jobs and certainly were usually unable to afford passage uh, to the most desirable areas. And they were also taken advantage of in many ways. For example, uh, these not understanding the language very well, this could lead to very unfair contracts being put out there where they were not... Um, uh, where they were either un under contract for longer periods of time or they were not guaranteed uh, very good conditions once they arrived. And in some places, the, the, uh, the conditions for these workers was not much better than what it had been under uh, our chattel slavery. Here's a little uh, section review for, for this. Take a look over it. I'm not going to read it to you. I've talked enough. Um, we'll move on. Uh, We'll continue to move on. I have a few more videos out there um, posted to Moodle, so take a look at them.
uh, to wrap up some of this information if you need supplements to your notes or if you need to make sense of some of what we've read. All right, guys, have a good day.